Welcome everyone to the Demystifying Architecture Metrics through ArcUnit by Gopi Shankar Haridas. We are glad to have you join us today. So over to you, Gopi Shankar. So thank you. Uh, just let me just quickly share my screen. Cool. So yes, uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, and uh, uh, it's it's, uh, it's quite a lot of sessions that have happened. I tried to attend a couple of them uh, today and it is quite interesting. So yes. Um, Let's start with the session. And before even we go with the session, I would like to introduce about myself. Uh, I'm Gopi Shankar Haridas. I'm currently working as an editor in uh, the Backline Group, uh, which is based in uh, UK. Uh, I have close to around 11 years of experience uh, doing multiple roles, like as a QA, as a developer, as a product owner uh, in different organizations so far. So yes, it's, it's a kind of it's a variety of varying experience I have uh, in my career. And I'm very happy to be here and uh, happy to see you all uh, Although I can't see you all, at, at least I can uh, I could interact with you all over, uh, with, with two questions. Um, yes, so the topic is demystifying architecture metrics through ArcUnit. Um, <clears throat> uh, before you even start, I would just like to give a quick disclaimer. It is more related toward Java coding architecture, uh, Java microservices, in 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 uh, 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 because there are different ways that you can test it. But this uh, ArcUnit tools is more the ArcUnit uh, tool that I've picked up is more related to uh, Java architecture. Uh, just like how uh, Animesh has uh, uh, mentioned, please drop in your question. I would like to take questions in, in between. And I would also be asking you questions so you could answer your answers. And uh, no answer is wrong. Nothing is stupid. As uh, it's just to keep, uh, like to keep the session as interactive as possible so that, you know, it's uh, it's something that we can, um, it's a two-way communication for both of us. That's one of the ground rules. Uh, I hope uh, that would happen. Okay, so let's go through the agenda. Uh, we will first, Briefly discuss, talk about the reasons why a Java coding architecture and application architecture can change. Um, and then followed by that, I'll be introducing to a tool called ArcUnit or ArcUnit, however you like to call. Um, and then after that, we'll be, uh, I'll be explaining you how it helped, <clears throat> what are the uh, approaches, how do you approach to write architecture tests in your, uh, uh, in your, in your uh, code base, how to bring in architecture tests in your code base and uh, what are the different architecture metrics. Um, and uh, then followed by that, there will be a quick demo on the architecture test that you can try to write and also about the architecture metrics uh, that you want to explore. So uh, let me just quickly see if, my, if the chat box is available. Um, yeah, yeah, the chat box is right in front of me. Cool. Reasons that affect a Java application architecture. That's the first, very first question. Uh, what are the common reasons uh, that you people feel uh, uh, is a reason uh, uh, that could help, that could be changing the application architecture that we decided to follow or that we diverted from the desired architecture. What are the common reasons? Any, any, anything, anything, uh, anything? I'm just looking at the chat box. Okay, so I think I will just go on. Uh, yeah, feel free to drop in whatever you feel. It's, it's uh, it's always good to be interactive so that we all learn together. So the first reason that I, most of the, the most thing is people would see is not being aware of the architecture. People are not being aware of what are the kind of design patterns or, or the, the way that we bring in solutions, right? That is something that people are not aware of. Uh, yes, Sunil Mahakur, uh, sorry, I don't know if I pronounce your name. Sunil Mahakur uh, takes more time to compile the code. Yes. Uh, that's a part of the program and uh, that's, uh, yeah, it, it's also mean that your code is not properly architected uh, or it takes a lot of time to really arrive to the solution. Yes, that's a good point. Yeah, so not being aware of, not aware of the architecture, that's very common because when uh, when when a new person joins to the team, uh, he or she might not have any idea of how to bring, uh, how to arrive to a solution, right? So uh, that, that's one of the very common reasons. That's one reason. Second, large use cases and projects. Yes, but we don't have, um, we don't, we have, we have seen there are a lot of use cases where you have very large code base. Uh, we don't really bother to stick to the architecture design. We just like to write the code in however uh, way that we wish to, or uh, because it's quite large. It's very, it's not easy to manage. It's not easy to maintain. Uh, I mean, I remember working on a, working on a code base where we have around, uh, you know, at least five to six pull requests from different, different teams of the same code base. So it's not like one person taking up, uh, going through the code review all the time. It means the whole day is just when gone, uh, just to use, uh, just to code review the whole, 
full record or merge request, right? So yes, we handling architectures in very large code base is pretty complex. It's it's not very easy. Yeah. Next, of course, new requirements. You have new requirements. A uh, very common reason is that you have a payment gateway and you want to handle different different payment method, uh, payment methods like Amazon Pay or Google Pay. And uh, how do we go for it? Uh, how do we implement that structure? So you would be a hard coding your existing payment pay. Okay, I'm always going to use credit card. So you just hard code it, but we don't really have any other way of uh, any other way of implementing payment methodology or payment methods in here. So that's another common reason. Uh, a common example, I could say. And yes, employee drop in and drop out. That's very common, right? I mean, you you I have you could see that people very common uh, people who have started the application and uh, moved out to a different organization or a different role uh, outside the particular project. And all you could, you could see that people are not being aware of what's happening in that code base. So that's very common. In fact, there are instances where a whole team has been shuffled and uh, ultimately there is a team of inexperienced developers in one team and then there are a team of experienced developers or uh, experienced people in another team. So they're not, the people who are in inexperienced areas are not really aware of how to even arrive to the solution. So these are the common reasons that uh, we could, there are many other reasons, but these are the very common reasons that we could say that uh, that really affects the Java application architecture or any application architecture as such. So this is where uh, Arch, you know, Arch Unit or Arch Unit comes into picture. Uh, Arch Unit is a, is a tool, it's a library uh, that can help us to uh, test the architecture uh, and in fact, uh, that is just uh, uh, validate the architecture of the code uh, at the same time, uh, also write unit tests on your architecture and do many things. So as mentioned, it helps in validate the architecture of your code base, Java code base, um, and uh, use it, 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 it's more like unit testing your architecture and not your features or functionalities. So your your functionalities that you, that you want to arrive at would be tested in the real uh, unit test. But uh, when, how do you arrive at it? Is, you can still arrive it, but how do you arrive it is, is way how we validate with architecture. It's more like one layer below that. So it helps us in creating an architecture documentation for the code. Um, so the code, the test that you see there, uh, you know, when I would when I wish I would show the demo, uh, you would see that it's more like reading. Uh, you would it's like reading. It's so readable. Anyone can just go through the test and understand. Okay, this is the kind of architecture that we designed to follow, and so we would just stick to it. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> We can also validate, uh, it can also write, uh, it also supports a variety of architecture uh, checked out of box. Uh, Arch unit also has a variety of architecture, uh, architecture checked out of box. So you could use that and ensure that your uh, code base is not violating that. Uh, it also supports a wide, uh, it supports um, Java un, uh, un, multiple, the unit test framework like Java J unit, but not test ng so far. Uh, that's still under progress. So yes, you could write your own test, uh, just like how you write a unit test through J unit. Yes, and in fact, you know, we can we can write our own. We can use this to write our own, uh, validate our own automation framework. Like test your architecture of your automation framework uh, within through Arcinet. That's possible because Arcinet is so it's so flexible that you don't really have to uh, write only for so the for write, write only for the uh, main code, main source code, and not just not the test. You can you can write your test. You can validate your structure in your test. You can also validate your actual implementation. So it's so flexible enough and so uh, super easy to use. So there are, as I mentioned, right? Arcturian supports a variety of uh, architecture uh, rules out of box. Um, <clears throat> uh, there are a general architecture general architecture checks that you can take up. There are package dependencies. There are inheritance and cyclic checks. Don't worry, I will I'll be explaining all these things uh, in the in the in the demo. So if you look at the package dependencies, it's more like classes belonging to a specific package. Uh, should be dependent. For example, um, a service you have a, you have a different layer, like right? uh, presentation layer, service layer, and uh, implementation layer. Uh, yeah. So when you have uh, when you have the presentation layer, uh, and then the in the controller, controller is dependent on uh, I mean, service is dependent on the controller, and then the repository is is like where a service calls the repository. That is how it how, that's how the layers are being formed, and that's how it's being used. So you could write your test in such a way that okay. My, the service should be dependent service. All the service classes should be called by the controller and not by anything else. Or the service class should not be called by repository. So otherwise, these are these are kind of ways that you can write tests. Uh, yeah. So just like a presentation layer, service layer, and persistence layer. 
you could also write your own custom check uh, own custom checks which you can which can help us to uh, uh, validate uh, the code base uh, or the code uh, type altogether so i'll be showing all of these in the demo so yeah brace uh, you could just uh, any questions so far from people okay yeah i'll just move on um okay how architecture test helps us um i uh, i yes. think question yeah it will yeah be... it will be a will it be applicable to code level or pipeline you could actually write it in the uh you could actually it's more like unit test uh viber uh you you write your unit test you could execute it in your code level and uh, and in the pipeline i assume you you're you're talking about the execution of the test in in the in the local code as well as in the pipeline so you could basically integrate the same in in yeah that's right so it, you can integrate the same test in the pipeline just like how you run your unit test okay cool uh how does it help us uh let's go to the next slide first and foremost it increases developers awareness of the coding architecture so as a developer when i joined to the team when i joined a team and i could see that people are um i don't have i've gone to the docs i've gone to the code bases uh yeah before i could even start uh, how can we leverage our unit in our java based automation as i told you as i told uh, as i mentioned sooner so it is about um it's not stopping you it's not something that we would see very common, but it's not stopping you. Uh, I have, uh, see, if you if you worked on a banking or a or an insurance uh, automation framework, like uh, you would see it's so huge, right? And people can uh, different developers or different uh, automation engineers would work across. And uh, what happens is that people arrive at their own implementation, even though the test is working. I could just write it in a, or everything in a simple main method, right? So that is possible. So ArchNet is something that you can uh, uh, help us to. Stop that it doesn't it doesn't let us to even uh in the co in, in the pipeline you to stop us okay it says that your uh your change is not following the architecture guidelines that we decided to follow so it stops us and then it gives a feedback to the to the artificial engineer that you have you have written a code in such a way that it's not following the guidelines maybe you have to change it so that is how you can do it um uh, i would show it in the demo uh, i would try to show these things in a demo uh, i assume it's good All right, so let's, if you look at the top four points, right? Uh, what are, how architecture tests can help us? It helps us to bring a developer awareness of coding architecture, as, men, as I said, when a new developer joins the team and um, he or she goes to the entire, uh, entire docs and tries to go to the code base and might not still have an idea of how uh, we should be writing uh, uh, our, or how we should be implementing our, the story card that we have picked up, the feature that we have picked up, right? So when we have architecture tests, uh, when when your change, as as I as I just said, when your change is not is developed in such a way it is not following the guidelines that we decided to follow, and it's fading, it gives you a feedback. Hey, you have not written the test, you have not implemented your feature in a in a in a way that we should be doing. So that's a feedback to them. So gradually, what happens? Developer will aware. Okay, he goes to the architecture test, tries to understand what is uh, what are the different types of how what is our architecture guidelines, and tries to keep a consistent design for the solution. So that is how we can do it. So that's one of the very common, uh, that's a very uh, very common help. Uh, that's a very common positive that we can get from uh, architecture test. At the same time, you can be a code-based architecture, just as I mentioned before, right? Your test actually is so readable enough that you could just go through it and understand, okay, for this particular package, I should not, it should not be accessed by this layer. So that's a very, I would be uh, sharing those things in the, in the, in the demo and you should probably go through each and every test uh, for your understanding. So what happens is that when you have, when you have checked, you have, when you validated your architect architecture changes through architecture unit test, uh, architecture unit test through Arch unit, you could go through in the code during the code review, you will have very lean uh, code review comments because it's about the feature that it, now the code review is not uh, not on how you implement it, it's about what you have implemented, right? So how you implement it is a structure. What you implemented is a feature, right? So we will be going through the features or how we are uh, we will be reviewing only those things because. We have we had to assure, okay, my architecture test will take care of everything. All I have to do is just go through and understand how this person has developed that feature. That's all I care about. So your code review time is lesser, the review comments will be lesser, and you'll be able to merge it and deploy it faster. So this is the incremental uh, advantage that Arch Unit or architecture test provide. 
It also helps in her calculating software architecture metrics. Um, so there are different metrics that are uh, uh, that's available uh, that we can try to uh, retrieve from using ArchNet. Uh, so I'll be going through a couple of them today, and uh, and possibly help you uh, to try to understand what is how can we validate our software architecture uh, through these metrics. And in fact, you could use UML diagrams as an input, and you could directly use the UML diagrams. Uh, but I think I would be skipping that. But uh, that's something that I would uh, ask people to uh, explore after the session. So these are the advantages. Uh, any questions from people so far? Okay, now so let's go for the architecture metrics, right? I mean, that's the whole title about demystifying architecture metrics. So let's go about the architecture metrics. What are the different architecture metrics that's available uh, uh, right now? So there are three different, actually, uh, the, the two is thing, but two are, these are two I commonly seen uh, using, but the third one is something that I also, uh, I might not have mentioned, but that's something that's already there. Cumulative dependency metric and component dependency metric. There's also another metric called visibility metrics, and that's by her, that's by a person called Herbert. Uh, but that's something uh, we might not have really used because you know you can already you know people used to get books right. That's so why people already buy clean architecture books. That's a very common way of uh, <laughs> that's a very common common thing common practice uh, people would do. So yes, so there are cumulative dependency metrics and component dependency metrics. So it, this is more like similar similar to code quality metrics, just like cyclomatic complexity or code coverage. Software architecture metrics tries to measure the structure and design of the software. So it can be, uh, architecture can be used to capture those, uh, these metrics. And uh, uh, these are the two metrics that can help us uh, to understand how our software architecture is faring. Cool. Cumulative component, cumulative dependency metrics. So this is defined by John Larko. Uh, he's the author of Last Case C++ Software Design. Uh, so cumulative the component metrics uh, is, a, is, a, is by is is more about thinking uh, uh, thinking more about the component and the elements. So whatever you package that you see here, for example, the controller or the service package or the repository package, everything is considered as component, and all the classes within it is considered elements. So that's why you see that there is a lot of components here. So for example, if you look, look at the cumulative component dependency and average component dependency, the the different definition of cumulative component dependency is sum of all the depends on value of all components. So if I could show you in a diagram here uh, on the right hand side, you have component one, component two, three, four, five, and up to six, right? So the component one is at the top, and then you have component two, and then four, and then the, at the lower down, the lower level we have six. Okay. So if you look at the depends on value of component one, it is like five. Why is it five? Because it depends on component two, and component two depends on component four. And component four depends, and then the component two again depends on component five, and at the same time component two again depends on component six directly, and component five depends on component six. All these components which I am talking about are basically packages. Okay, so it's about that <laughs> you can consider this component one as controller, and then you have like a presentation layer, and then the service layer, and then the uh, and then the um, uh, and then the and then the presentation layer, etc. So there is controller, services, models, right, repositories data access object, etc. So all of these are considered as components, all these packages. So that's why you see here, uh, if you look at the component, uh, cumulative component uh, dependency is sum of all the depends on value of all components. So if you look at it, it's going to be 18 because it's five plus five, four, 14, and then we have another four, which is 18. So that is what you call as the cumulative component dependency, the whole as a whole project. And there is another value, uh, another metric called average component dependency. Um, the average component dependency is basically the the cumulative component dependency divided by the number of components that we have. So if you look at it, it's there are one, two, three, six components, and that we have the average the cumulative component dependency's value is eighteen. So eighteen divided by six, six is basically three. So that is the average component dependency that we have. So how does this help us? You understand that we understand that we have multiple dependencies across uh, each component, right? So there is dependencies between different pack, different components in the form of average also. So how do you bring it out? We can we can basically use these values to understand how our code is flowing off and how we can bring it, uh, you know, even reduce it further or make it more uh, reusable or more modular. That is the way that we can try to use. Uh, cumulative component, uh, sorry, cumulative dependency metrics, which is something that people would have 
shared about. It's a component dependency matrix. This is what I was talking about. It's about Robert. It's defined by Robert C. Martin, um, the author of Clean Architecture, which I just showed. Uh, <clears throat> so if you look at uh, uh, if you look at if you have read about, if you have read Clean Architecture, you would see there is efferent coupling and afferent coupling, fan out fan and These are terms that helps us to understand how our component or how our um, dependencies, how our number of modules are dependent on each other. Okay. So for example, if the one that you see efferent coupling, also known as fan out, uh, it, it represents the number of dependencies that a module has on other dependencies. It's basically out, outward dependency. People, uh, I depend on others. For example, the controller has a dependency on service because that's being called. The service has a dependency on repositories and then on the domain object, et cetera. So this is the called this is called as the outward, outward dependency. Outgoing dependency, that's a better word to use, efferent coupling. And then we have, so uh, then we have afferent coupling, afferent coupling, also known as dependencies, inward dependencies, where we depend on others. For example, it represents the number of dependencies, uh, number of dependencies that other modules have on the module that is in question. So it's like you have, how do you say? Um, it's, it's like if you see here, right, uh, if you go to the diagram here, the component one and component three, that is, it has an efferent coupling of one. Why? Efferent coupling is basically outgoing. It's outgo it, it depends on component two. Similarly, the component two has an efferent coupling of C. C is called efferent and C A is called efferent coupling. That's the terminology that we use. So C uh, the efferent coupling of component two is three, which because we have uh, we have one, two, three. That is like four, five, and six are the outgoing depend outgoing dependencies. And afferent coupling is two, is because there are two components at the top that is dependent on this. So this is what you call as efferent coupling and afferent coupling. The basic basic way is fan in and fan out. That's a very easy way to understand. <clears throat> well, we have uh, how does this really help us? So a lower level of efferent coupling uh, is generally considered as ideal because when classes have lower level of efferent coupling, it means they have very few dependencies on other classes, making them more modular and easier to understand and easier to maintain also. So that is the reason why uh, why we have efferent coupling, and then we have afferent coupling. It also measures like how uh, it's an, a moderate level of afferent, afferent coupling is considered ideal because the component should not have too many outgoing dependencies, uh, oh, sorry, too many incoming de dependencies because it is massively dependent. It, it can lead to coupling issues, uh, making the system very hard to uh, difficult, very hard difficult to maintain and manage uh, the overall uh, component. So yes, then there is another value called instability. Uh, instability is basically your outgoing dependencies divided by the sum of outgoing and incoming dependencies. So if you look at it, um, let's say if, if you look at the component two's instability, the fan out is basically three, right? Uh, fan out is basically three, three divided by two is basically uh, three divided by two. I'm oh, sorry, it's, it's, actually, uh, it's actually three divided by Two plus three, so three by five, which is, is zero point six. So this is what we call as instability. So one way to count this, uh, so it's with this count will allow us to calculate the positional stability of the component. So when we have an instability value of like zero or close to zero, it means your component is so stable enough, and it's if it is, it's very really less likely to change, and it's so stable enough. If the instability metric that you see here is around one, it means this model is unstable and is more likely to change as as the dependencies keep growing. So that is how we decide how uh, we use this efferent coupling, afferent coupling, and instability. And as mentioned, there is also another dependency. There is also another metric called a visibility metric, and that's by Herbert Dwell. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't really explore that much uh, so far, um, and because uh, her, uh, that's something I would like to relate these two uh, for the audience today. So yes, that's Something uh, <clears throat> next, I would like to show you how to approach architecture test. Um, any questions on so far on these? So, you, how do you approach architecture test? How do you approach writing architecture test? So now you feel like okay, uh, we have unit tests for architecture for our software architecture, which is good. We have different metrics which we can uh, use and which you can help us to gauge the architecture health of the overall uh, of, of the overall application. So, how do you use it? So the best way is. Evaluate 
uh, the current dependency structure metrics of uh, uh, of your application. So if you have used IntelliJ IDEA uh, Ultimate, especially, uh, you would be uh, there is a way that you can get uh, a dependency structure metric. So this basically shows you this gives you a representation of how how components how your components or elements are dependent on each other. So that's a, that's a, that's something that you should be taking a look at. And next, even if you don't have this, it's perfectly fine. Uh, you start with very, very basic, uh, simple rules, and then carefully select the rules that we agreed, uh, uh, that we agree by me in the team, sit along with the team, have a conversation. Okay, see that we have following a presentation layer, service layer, and a an, uh, persistent layer methodology. This is the kind of layer that you follow. This is a layered approach that we have in, in our architecture. So let's just keep it. Let's just write the very, very basic test around these, around these layers. That's the first step that you can take. Next. Write these architecture. That's a the, these are basic set of rules. Now write architecture, uh, architecture tests for these decided rules, and then have a conversation. Present to the team. So once you present to the team, and then people feel like, okay, this is a kind of these are very basic uh, architecture rules. We can actually uh, you know add more down the line, and that's perfectly fine. So let's have very basic rules now, and then integrate to the CI so that you get feedback for every pull request that, or every merge request that you do. Of course, you have to revisit uh, these tests because you have to ensure your your application architecture cannot might not need you know, all of them are not same. Like people have their own way of uh, developing things, and they have different they follow different architecture design patterns or different architecture rules and guidelines. So we have to <clears throat> we have to expand our architecture test so that we cover up all these areas. That's where custom checks comes in the picture. So we had to fix the existing violation and then the refactor the code and then uh, revisit the test periodically and add more tests. This is how you can approach. So you could start with something very basic uh, uh, and then you could expand later on. Okay, so now I will just show you a quick demo of how architecture tests are written. And uh, let me just quickly... So yeah, this is a very common um, uh, uh, this is a very common application, Spring Boot application that I have a very very basic Spring Spring Boot application. Uh, it's more like you have order controllers, uh, you have your presentation layer which is the controller, and then you have your service layer, and then your persistent layer which is where you have repositories and which basically interacts with your Ruby objects. So I just created a very basic one uh, just for the, for an example. So. <clears throat> One of the common things, let's go through the code one by one. So if you look at your con controller, right? Um, so we are, this is a, this is a, this is a Spring Boot uh, REST controller. You have record mapping, and then you have your get request, and then your post request. Uh, but uh, yeah, there is also this roles allowed annotation, which basically helps us to implement RBAC, role-based access control. And uh, this calls the services. Again, same with the payment controller. They also have uh, get mapping and the RBAC as well as the payment call to the services. So if you look at how we can test it, one of the common issues that you see here is your roles allowed is basically empty. So you can just create your roles and then you could leave it empty. So a developer can basically write another uh, a developer can basically write another endpoint and then you can leave the roles allowed empty, right? That's possible. So we don't really want to do that, or we all we have to do is just have some value here. We can ensure that we have proper values here. So that is a custom architecture test that you can use. So for example, um, so before even, I, before even I go to this, let me just go to the control architecture test. So your control architecture test should have, so we are, we are ensuring that your all your endpoints are should have an annotation called roles allowed to ensure we have a uh, role-based access control in place. So this, if you look at this, when I say the code, is, the test is readable, see, it has method and that should be annotated with these rules because controller method should be followed by RBAC. So this is one of the tests. Well, uh, if you look at it, uh, how do we even point to this? That is where these analyze classes that uh, annotation comes into picture. So when you analyze class, uh, when you uh, give the package to which uh, the classes should be analyzed. Yeah, so if you see here, there is this annotation called analyze classes. This is where we would decide which package that we have to uh, consider for writing tests. And uh, we can also specify because our package has, you could use the same package in com spring boot test arc unit. We can have it in our main package as well as in the test uh, source folder. <clears throat> so that is where we have this uh, option called do not include test. So if you want to include only the source code, then we could we could just mention that do not include test. So Sunil, to answer your question, you can basically write your uh, 
uh, architecture test for your test, if you have import option dot to only include test. So this will include only the test that you want and uh, basically write, uh, basically use that uh, test test. So you, so wherever you have JN test annotation, it would probably be picked uh, here. I hope I answered the question now. Cool. Uh, cool. So yes. So going to the going to the uh, test one by one, right? So when you have um, a, co a controller class, um, you always want your controller. This is how the layer goes on, right? Your so presentation service and uh, uh, your presentation presentation layer should always be uh, not be accessible from only from outside. So your uh, endpoints are accessible only from outside. So that's why you see that no classes that are not controller classes should access that layer. Should access controller classes. So these are ways that you can write. Uh, so let let me let me get out of presentation mode and uh, yeah. So now when you go back to the custom architecture tool test. So when I say that you could that you could uh, uh, there's a way that you can uh, you can leave your roles allowed annotation as empty and it would basically work. Uh, it's because you want to ensure that your annotations are properly having a value. Like for example, this particular. Uh, admin orders can only be retrieved by user roles, anyone with user roles, and anyone with create order, or maybe this can be used by anyone can, only the admin can retrieve the orders, and only the user can create a user to uh, create an order. So you can specify this, but again, uh, if you don't have these, it will basically work. So if you look at the control architecture test, right? <clears throat> If you, if you run all these tests, what happens is that it would check whether, whether your controller is having proper annotation, and at the same time, it will check whether your uh, control methods are properly accessed. And then it would also check if your your controller methods are returning a domain entity object and not as a, a response entity instead of returning domain objects. This is failing because our controller is returning a, a domain object here and not an response entity. So we can, that's just for you to show. Uh, so if you look at, the custom architecture test, right? I'm taking up, so the, if you look at this test, we are, we are using the Java classes from the controller and I'm specifying the condition as roles allowed. And for all these conditions, uh, any, any all the methods that have annotated with roles allowed, if it is empty, if the value is empty, like if you see the value is empty, then it would basically fail. So if I run this one, uh, for both the controllers, we don't have any response, uh, uh, any values for roles allowed, so it would definitely fail. You see that, right? So, <clears throat> what if, so what I'm going to do is, right, I'm going to specify rules. So I'm going to specify the rules as admin, and then the user, and then the payment can also be done by the user. And when we write the test. So we have a question. Um... Yeah. Someone is asking, like, what all design patterns or architecture it supports? Uh, well, it doesn't support anything out of box. It's about how you write tests. Like, it's about how you implement, uh, how you write your arch architecture tests. So, for example, if you see here, there is a strategy pattern that I've tried to implement here. Um, <clears throat> there is a context class that is missing. But ideally, uh, if you have a payment uh, application and you're, if you're supporting multiple payments, then there are different ways that you can write it. And one of them is using strategy patterns. So you, it's about how you implement it and then how you write your own test. So to answer the question, uh, you have to write your own custom uh, custom controller test, uh, custom uh, architecture test to uh, write your own custom architecture test to arrive to that particular uh, pattern. Yeah, so if you want to, so yeah, coming back to the roles allowed, right? Uh, now you you just saw that, uh, you know, I've just given the value for the roles allowed, uh, for the roles allowed R back annotation uh, with the value or with the particular, with the appropriate roles. And once I run the test, uh, the test is test is passing because it's no more empty. It's no more uh, empty or null, right? So this is the way that you can write your custom test. Um, I could I could write something new, but that would take some time. So that's why I'm not uh, writing uh, writing anything new now. So if you look at the test now, right? It's it's like your classes that are that reside in this controller package uh, should have roles annotated roles allowed annotated annotations with values. Okay, we are validating that here because those allowed annotation should should have an um, uh, should not have an empty value uh, of our security purposes if they're not using that. So yes, this is a way that you can write your own custom architecture test. So 
there are different other uh, 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 tests that uh, architecture provides out of box. So, for example, <clears throat> there is this general architecture test where you don't really have to use uh, all of these are just I have not written any of these are just uh, available in Archinet documentation. So you should not be using your standard stream. So wherever you have, uh, where you have to log something or write down something, you basically have to use a logger and not a not a system a standard stream like system dot dot print and now system dot 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 error. So this is a rule that is out of box that's available. Then the next is you no class to throw a generic exception. So uh, these are generic code uh, generic coding rules. So you're not supposed to throw a generic uh, exception uh, in, in any classes or any methods. <laughs> uh, yeah, then we also have uh, uh, util logging. So even if you try to use loggers, uh, there are there are, there are instances where we uh, import java.util.log instead of uh, using the log4j or uh, sl4j library here. So these are the common available rules, uh, general architecture rules, arc unit comes out of box. Similarly, you could also write your naming convention test. Like for example, if any if there are any classes that are annotated with REST controller, should have a simple name ending controller dot class. Um, should should have a simple name ending controller. So if I change this as uh, if I name name this particular test as order controller to order order layer, okay, uh, just naming it for for this purpose. And if I run this naming test. What happens is that it basically fails here because your controller is not following uh, your the controller your architecture where you have to have uh, a controller name at the end for any class that ends that has a this controller annotation is being uh, is violating here. So that's why you see this uh, you see this one. So you say that okay, uh, it says that it does not have a simple name ending with controller. So your order layer, it has it doesn't it resides under it this is a class that has a rest controller annotation, but unfortunately doesn't have a name, uh, a name ending a controller. Well, so uh, let's rename it back. So, um, Gopi, uh, just a reminder that we are running short on our time. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'll just quickly go through the architecture metrics. Uh, uh, so, if you look at it, <clears throat> uh, we were we were working on. Uh, we, I was I was showing about two different uh, metrics, right? So, if you look at the component dependency metric. Uh, uh, I'm using uh, uh, I'm using the default package, and for the controller, I'm getting the efferent, efferent, and instability, efferent coupling, efferent coupling, and instability metrics. Uh, so if you look, if you run this particular, this is only for controller, okay? So I can basically explain that. So the value is efferent coupling is two because yeah, the efferent coupling is two, and the efferent coupling is zero, and the efferent, uh, and okay, it's it's instability. Uh, this is instability. Well, so the instability is uh, one. So let's arrive. Let's see how it how we arrive to that. It's because your payment controller has a dependency on outgoing dependency on service, right? Payment controller uses an order uh, the the order the order controller uses an order service, and the payment controller uses a payment service. There are two outgoing dependencies. Well, is any other class dependent on the uh, using controller? No, because controller is not be accessed by any other layers apart from the uh, I mean, apart from all these like service and repository controller can't be accessed uh, only through the access when through the Spring Boot or through Spring Boot once it has been invoked, right? So <clears throat> that is something. So that's why you see that after copy the number of incoming dependencies uh, to these two to these two controllers zero. So now the instability value is basically one. Why? Because it's two divided by two plus zero, right? Its instability is basically efferent coupling divided by afferent plus efferent coupling. So it's two divided by two plus zero, which is going to be one. So that is why you see the stability as one. So any as mentioned, instability will, um, it's always good to have your instability value close to zero. And if it is around one or one plus, it basically means that your system is not stable enough. So we have to refactor this code base uh, a bit, or maybe I, uh, or maybe, you know, if we have to get through this controller and point to a better package, yeah, that could be a better answer today. Uh, so this is on the architecture metric, and uh, <clears throat> uh, I would also like to show about one more thing. Um, uh, yeah, we could also define the layers that we want. For example, if you want a, a, a layer, like for example, this, this is an application layer, and then a controller and service response and entity. 
So we want to ensure that we follow this layered architecture and uh, we don't really uh, violate this. Then we can write a test for it and then run it. So, so if I mark this as uh, mark this as an architecture test, uh, you would see that passing because we are not violating anything here. So yes, it's passing because if you see here, your controller has a service and the service has repositories, right? And your repository has uh, well, it has nothing, but basically it has uh, the domain object here. So. <clears throat> So if what if you have a half baked uh, architecture for now, or you have some violations here, you can use this arc ignore, which basically ignores this test. So when you run this test, it basically, I mean, it will not be, uh, it will be completely be ignored. Gopi, I, uh, we are out of time. Okay. Yeah. So this is how you can use uh, architect and architecture metrics and uh, architecture, uh, architecture test to uh, have a cleaner and maintainable code base. So yes. So. Uh, I'm available in the Hangouts room for uh, more questions. Um, um, please reach out to me there, and I'm happy to help you there.